Good afternoon. My name's Emma King. I'm the CEO of the Victorian Council of Social Service. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's VCOS DHHS COVID-19 seminar. Um, I would like to recognise the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today and the traditional owners of the land across Victoria. Since our last webinar just a month ago, the situation has changed significantly. We've had more confirmed cases and we now have a number of suburbs that are in lockdown. We know that this is really tough for so many in our community, in particular for those people who are high risk, uh, for those who are unable or find it difficult to isolate, and for those who are facing further hits to their income. Community sector organisations are again vital. They're vital for the support that they provide and the connection that they provide for, for people in our community. So it is very timely that we have with us today, Tammy Din and Natalia Alia, from the public health team to talk through what this means for community sector organisations and the people who use our services. So I might throw it over to whichever of you would like to start, but perhaps just to begin with, can you talk to us about what the current advice is and what you would like people to know? Um, I'll hand it over to either of you, Tammy or, or Natalie, whichever of you would like to start. Hi, um, thanks for having us here um, this afternoon. Um, so we appreciate it's a very difficult time for everyone and um, the current public health advice in particular to community services is that those residing in restricted postcodes, um, the community facilities and services can still operate if you're hosting it for a public support service, uh, like a food bank or hosting essential support group. Um, and community halls can open for weddings for five to 10 people respectively in line with the new restrictions. Um, however, all the other community facilities um, must remain closed, and these include um, sort of libraries, the toy centres, uh, the youth centres, um, and community halls where it's not used for any other purpose. Um, so for the community service staff where you're working from um, where you can, we encourage working from home, um, video conferencing where possible, and we understand that some services are face-to-face. -face. Um, so in these situations, um, if you're continue, continuing to operate, just remember the safeguards that um, we've previously advised you in terms of maintaining um, good uh, hygiene, um, physical distancing of at least 1.5 metres from others, um, and following the density quotient when you're operating in enclosed spaces of no more than 20 people or the four square metre rule. Thanks very much, Natalia. I think um, also what advice would you give to community sector organisations that have people travelling in and out of the hotspot? So it's obviously a really, um, you know, we've seen a number of changes there just over the last couple of days and with the changes coming to effect um, midnight last night. Do you have advice specifically for people who've got staff travelling in and out of the hotspot? Yeah, so, um, so visiting a restricted postcode uh, when you're outside a postcode is actually only permitted for one of four reasons. So um, those are, just as a reminder, for food study and work, um, for shopping for food and supplies, uh, for care and caregiving and exercise. And um, if, you can't, if you can work from home, you should work from home. Um, so where possible, um, the community service organisations should really encourage staff to limit travelling in and out of the hotspots. Um, if you do need to travel through these restricted postcodes, you can, um, but just plan your trip so that you don't need to stop in those areas unless it is for one of those four reasons. Um, so see if you can make some amendments to logistical plans that you make um, so that you can avoid where possible those restricted postcodes. Um, and so entering into a restricted postcode, um, sort of maintaining all of those safeguards and protocols and screening staff and clients that you currently have um, to continue to do so, um, to monitor symptoms um, and what I mentioned before about hygiene, safe um, physical distancing from others um, and making sure you sort of the good cough etiquette as well. Thank you for that. Uh, and in terms of community service, um, staff from community service organisations that are working within hotspots, does the Department of Health or DHHS recommend that they should be wearing masks? So at this point in time, we haven't pushed a formal recommendation um, for any staff or the general public to wear masks. 
Um, however, if but if individuals choose to do so, then they can. Um, I, know, I know what we're saying is that um, if organisations can support that as best as possible, um, that, that will be okay. Um, but it's really key to remember that masks is just one line of defence against. Um, and the as results that were showing, um, it's more of a protective mechanism for when you're unwell so that you don't cough on others. But when you're in the healthy community, we're not seeing um, much of sort of evidence of that protective. And we're starting to see more now um, as more evidence comes through. So what you're trying to, what we want to encourage is if you are wearing masks, that you also make sure that you don't forget um, those other things like good hand hygiene um, and maintaining physical distancing. So wearing a mask does not um, automatically allow you to stand closer to somebody else. So there's just a few things that you need to be really careful about when you're wearing a mask um, and all of those other things that we've, we've encouraged so far in this COVID period um, remains just as important. Thanks, Tammy. And I guess just to extend that conversation out, I'm not sure whether yourself or Natalia wants to answer, but in terms of things, I know there's lots of um, mixed communications um, more broadly across the community about what does that mean if you're taking public transport? What does it mean if you're going to the supermarket, for example? Is it the same advice that you've just given there if you're, you know, um, just going out to do your shopping or is it sort of particular advice? I know we're seeing more and more people uh, who are wearing masks at the moment. So any kind of general advice that you have on that front as well? Yeah, so the masks, um, the masks, uh, debate is will will is always in serious um, consideration, um, particularly when we're seeing more cases in Victoria. So we're not saying that we will um, not make a recommendation um, to not wear masks on an ongoing period. It is uh, sort of a constantly changing um, situation we're facing here. So that might be something that we will um, definitely communicate. Um, so in terms of public transport and shopping. At this point in time, um, you, if you choose to wear a mask, you can do so, um, but you um, don't need to. Um, but when you're out in the supermarket, when you're out in public transport, um, where possible um, to maintain that 1.5 metre distance from somebody else. Thank you. Uh, in terms of one of the answers we've had from a number of different uh, member organisations of ours, um, comes to um, issues around testing. So it's around if someone takes a test and they're waiting for results, we know that they should isolate uh, while they're waiting. Can you talk to us a bit about what happens with immediate family members? So if you're waiting on a test for your household, you're well at the time. Uh, if you're an immediate family member is someone who's had a test but you haven't, can they go to work or can they go to school, for example? Or what advice is the the um, the health office giving around um, around this? Uh, Natalia, did you want to? Yeah. So uh, for people that have been in uh, contact with a suspected case of uh, COVID nineteen, they don't need to isolate uh, or seek testing unless they're directed to by the department uh, department's case and contact team. I guess so. That means for family members immediate family members in the same household, you can go to work and you can go to school. Um, but I guess uh, these people, doesn't mean that, that, that they're out of the woods, uh, they should continue to monitor for symptoms, even if mild and seek testing if, uh, if they're concerned. But on the other hand, if people who have symptoms, again, even if they're mild, they should stay at home um, if unwell and await test results. Um, yeah, so that, but there may be other situations where I guess as part of the, um, the testing blitz that people are, that's happening throughout our suburbs at the moment, that if they don't have symptoms, they don't have to stay at home until they get their results. So there's, a, I guess, a few different scenarios which um, this all can apply. And I know we've had questions from employers as well about saying, well, if we've got a staff member who's gone and they've been tested, whether they've been symptomatic or asymptomatic, what does that mean in terms of for themselves and for um, their immediate family members as well. Are you able to, so I, I know in particular, we've had questions around saying, well, my employee has been tested. They don't have symptoms, but they're in, for example, a hotspot. So they've decided to get tested. Um, 
they know that they don't come to work until I get the results back. So the same advice still applies in terms of family members, et cetera, as well in that scenario. Yeah, I'd say so. And with the employers, I think it's always a good um, thing to remember around our communication to other employees and um, around if, if there was a suspected case or a, hopefully not a confirmed case, but if there's not, then um, yeah, encourage that ongoing communication with employers and employees. Yep. So just to be really clear, because this is one we've had lots of questions about. So if you've got a family member who's tested, um, they're waiting for the results. As an immediate family member, you're not required to stay at home. You can you can go to work, etc. But of course, if you can stay from if you can work from home, that's what you know you would do, etc. As well. But you are actually able to go to work. So it's probably a conversation they need to have within the workplace. If your employer then would prefer that you stay at home until you get your test result. Is that correct? Thank you very yeah. much. And if, you're in a, and if you're in a restricted postcode, um, if you can work from home, you should be working from home. Um, and, you know, if you have any symptoms, however mild, stay home. Thank you. Uh, in terms of, um, I guess, another uh, set of advice we've uh, received from employers is some, well, they're wanting some clarification around, would you advise um, separating staff who've operated in hotspots from those that haven't entered uh, those particular postcodes or priority postcodes or hotspots. Yeah, if if um, I guess it depends on the organisation and um, if the business model allows it. To me, that sounds like a completely sensible idea to separate your two um, with your employees who have been in hotspots and the employees that have not. Um, so yeah, idea for example is you can have a team A and a TB um, working on the roster. We completely understand that that may not entirely be possible for all um, organisations. Thank you. Uh, and just one last question for um, the two of you, for Tammy and, and, Nat and Natalia. Um, in terms of, um, has any particular consideration been given to people with disability in our community? Uh, and I guess I'm thinking about any material that can be distributed um, that's particularly sensitive to people who may have disabilities in relation to testing in regard to COVID or to COVID more generally as well? And I guess any general information or advice that you have? Yeah, um, yes, we, we're def there is a strong um, sort of interest in our public health team um, regarding this and um, the public health team we touched base um, prior to this meeting are really keen um, for community services to reach out to us um, and kind of uh, give us a little bit of uh, pointers um, and helping uh, with messaging. We understand at the moment there isn't that much out there, um, but we are definitely um, opening up this opportunity um, and would appreciate sort of any support from you, um, from the community services group to, to help us um, kind of streamline our messaging. Um, I've, I've got a key contact who would be happy to talk to anyone. So um, please feel free to reach out with us. Um, but most of our usual comms channels um, is through our website, which we understand, um, you know, has some accessibility issues as well. Thank you for that. And if you're able to share that key contact with us, we'll put that up on the VCOS website uh, and look at making sure that we share it through our distribute our channels uh, and also uh, making sure that we keep that live as well. So I know there's a number of organisations that work with people who have disability for whom this has been a really key question as well. So. Can I just say a big thank you, Tammy and Natalia, for stepping in today. We really appreciate it. And as you would appreciate as you would appreciate as well, uh, there are so many people who've got every question, every decision they're making is based on that health information first and foremost. And then the decisions are made from that point. Can I also just say a huge thank you? I know that you are working day and night for the benefit of Victoria. We appreciate it enormously and really appreciate the time that you've been able to give to us today. Uh, the, the questions you've answered have been really some of the key ones that BCOS has been receiving in terms of the lead into today. And it is amazing when you think back just a month ago again, how much things have continued to change since that time. So a huge thank you for joining us today. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, it's now my absolute pleasure to introduce Ben Rimmer. Um, Ben is the Deputy Secretary and Director of Housing at DHHS, and I believe also the current Associate Deputy uh, Secretary for DHHS. Thank you very much for being here, Ben, and for joining us today. Uh, so perhaps if I can uh, just kick off with some questions as well for you, Ben. 
Uh, reaching cold communities with appropriate health information is, you know, can be difficult. Um, so how is the government managing this challenge and what can community organisations do to help? Thanks, Emmett, um, and great question. Um, first, can I just start perhaps by, um, on behalf of uh, DHHS and my colleagues acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the country that people are meeting on all across Victoria and um, acknowledging elders past, present and future. And also just say how fantastic it is that um, Emma, you and Vikos and your colleagues have been running these forums, which are, I think, incredibly valuable in helping share information uh, in the community. Um, so look, the, the issues of engaging um, well with cold communities have been incredibly important to us um, right from the start of this process, but in particular in the last few weeks, um, as we've seen a really different kind of pattern of um, transmission of COVID emerge. Um, so obviously some of the, the basic things that have been done include translation of the advice and restrictions. We're now translating routinely into 53, uh, 53 languages. Uh, there's specific advertising campaigns focusing on different cultural communities um, that are um, uh, in testing at the moment and we imagine will be scheduled to continue until the end of August. Um, radio advertising in 22 different languages, that kind of stuff. Um, I, I don't know, people may have seen um, the the uh, the door-to-door -door work that's going on now includes QR codes and things to, to really make it as simple as possible for people to engage in languages of their choice and to uh, and to make that easy. Perhaps more more importantly even than that is um, we've done a lot of work recently through the Victorian Multicultural Commission uh, to reach out um, uh, to specific organisations, community organisations, faith-based organisations. Um, a lot of work in particular with the Islamic Council of Victoria um, around the Cultural Advisors Program. Uh, and all of that is incredibly important in helping reach community members in, in ways that um, are meaningful to them. Um, so there's videos in language being produced through that partnership. Um, and look, more than anything, we know that people are wanting information from sources that they trust. For some of the, that, that means from, um, from government. Uh, for, some of that, uh, for some of us, that means from um, community organisations, from um, more informal networks. So we just need to work with all of that uh, as we um, as we work through this. Thanks, Ben. And I know organisations like Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria, for example, play such a pivotal role and um, are, are very keen to assist at the moment as well uh, in making sure we can get the best possible information out to all of our communities. Um, Secondly, many Aboriginal people, including elders and people with existing chronic disease are obviously at very high risk if they were to uh, contract COVID-19. Can you talk um, a bit about what's being done to engage at risk Aboriginal communities, their peak bodies and ACOs, that's um, Aboriginal community um, controlled organisations in a way that's culturally safe and appropriate? Yeah, such a great question because right from the start of this um, epidemic, we've been, I think all of us have been very um, committed collectively to making sure that we do whatever we can to prevent the transmission of um, COVID within Aboriginal communities. And I think we're all aware of this huge um, significance around the role of elders and the, the vulnerability of elders to disease and how um, important it is that we, uh, we do whatever we can to prevent, uh, prevent that taking place. I really wanna reinforce everything that we're doing in this area starts from um, the department's com total commitment to Aboriginal self-determination. Um, and you know we, we won't always live up to that objective uh, but that, that is our absolute commitment to, um, to lead from a position of self-determination. So as a result, we've worked very closely with ACOs through the whole process. Um, I think in combination with, um, with VATSHO, there were two digital forums that particularly targeted ACOs, one in March, one in June. I, I'm told, I, I wasn't part of these, but I'm told almost 200 people attended those 
um, really trying to help spread the message, a bit like today's session, but um, spread the message in a way that's particularly tailored uh, with our internal Aboriginal strategy and Aboriginal health teams really tailored to meeting the needs of ACOs. There's been newsletters and all kinds of other things that we're doing uh, on that front. So there's a lot of work with ACOs. There's also a lot of work in making sure that our own activities are uh, tailored to the best possible extent uh, for, um, for communities. Um, there's a specific um, kind of set of information on our um, website for Aboriginal community information about COVID-19. And look, we've really been conscious of the fact that people get their information in all kinds of different ways. Some of us kind of watch the nightly news. Some of us um, look at a website. Some of us um, get information in different ways from different people with different levels of trust associated with that. And we really need to work with all of those different, um, you know, we need to try as many different techniques and, and approaches as we can uh, to try and um, make sure that we're getting through uh, the right messages in the right way to the right groups. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It is definitely not a one size fits all and appreciate the fact that that's well and truly recognised. And I think also acknowledging that um, we've really watched uh, the government and, and all of the staff work really continuously say, well, how do we keep learning, particularly as the pandemic continues in ways that we wouldn't have anticipated at the beginning as well. Uh, in terms, I guess, jumping to the sort of the federal space, but also things that are going to have a really big impact on us is we're getting really close to some of the Commonwealth emergency financial support ending um, or up for review. I know we'll, we'll know on the 23rd of July from the federal government with their mini budget, uh, what might be likely to happen in terms of things like the JobKeeper um, allowance and the current increase to job seeker allowance and, and the possibility of those being removed. I guess just keen to ask, I'm not sure if you can answer the question, Ben, I'm possibly putting you into a difficult position here, but keen to just to ex explore what the Victorian government can do to really cushion the potential impact here. Sure, great question. I mean, look, the, the truth is there is a lot of uncertainty about these things right now as we speak. Uh, I don't think, uh, well, for, first of all, the, the environment is changing rapidly, uh, in particular in Victoria. Secondly, um, uh, not all of these decisions have yet been taken. Um, the, uh, and, and there is at the moment a, you know, a really significant challenge associated with the end of September. But I think everyone is very aware of that and very focused on that. Um, what I can say from the Victorian government perspective is there is a huge amount of time and effort going in at the moment to working out how best to invest in, to support, to plan for that period that goes, you know, through September right out into uh, 2021. And I, I know the Victorian government are completely committed to making sure that that process works in a way that's smooth, that encourages economic and social recovery for the Victorian community right through that period. Uh, so there's a whole range of things that are going into that. I mean, just a recent example of that is um, the one-off $1,500 worker support payment that was announced. I can't even remember how long ago it was announced. It feels like weeks, but I think it's probably last Thursday or something, um, which really came from a, a very real recognition that for some people in the community, people who are perhaps more marginal in the workforce, we were beginning to see some real barriers to, um, to getting tested and to uh, and to isolating that emerged from that. So I think that shows just how responsive and quick uh, the Victorian government policy processes are at the moment in terms of adjusting to, to things as they, uh, as they emerge. Um, we'll have to work out what to do with the rent relief grants. Um, there's uh, a whole range of other things that have gone in in the, in the last little while that we'll need to work out how to, how to manage through the rest of 2020. Thanks, Ben. And you're right, in terms of looking at what's been done in very short spaces of time and some of the announcements that were perhaps only last week that feel like they were about a year ago in many respects, don't they? Uh, just one um, sort of final point for me and then I'd like to throw over you for just sort of any general comments you want to make, but really um, mindful, I guess, going back to the initial sort of conversation that we had around migrant communities and being really mindful that um, I guess it's looking at the information we're getting out there, but the fact that um, a number of migrants come from 
countries that have experienced war and the impact of seeing military personnel um, on our streets and being involved in the COVID response situation. And I guess just triggering kind of particularly traumatic events for people and really just keen to sort of get any, any comments from you around what the department has underway, what government has underway to, to sort of manage and to mitigate this to whatever extent possible as well. Yeah, great question. Look, I mean, the, the bottom line is we're very aware of this issue and I, I can tell you from first-hand experience that it's, it's really factoring into the discussions and decisions that are taking place about how best to, uh, to respond. Uh, I, I, I think we're doing an okay job on this front at the moment. If you look at, uh, if, you know, people might have some experience with some of the people doing door knocking, um, the community engagement teams that are um, engaging in uh, some of the hotspot suburbs, um, you know, many, many of those people are being recruited locally. Um, they're wearing jackets, but they're not coming in khaki and camouflage. Uh, and they're really coming, they, you know, our aspiration is that they come into communities from a perspective of community support and engagement and connection to services, connection to language, connection to information. Um, but that said, there will be more police around in hotspot suburbs. Um, there are now Defence Force personnel on the ground in Victoria in some places, and, um, and that will have an impact for some people. And I think, you know, with our partners in the sector, we just need to be very mindful of that um, and really mindful of uh, the different ways that people in our community are experiencing the same crisis. It's kind of one crisis, but, you know, a million different um, experiences, if that makes sense. Uh, it makes perfect sense. And I think you're right in terms of looking at um, recruiting people from local communities so that uh, when, when there are people potentially knocking on your door, there are people that you know and trust and... Um, as you say, people want their, their, their sort of their information from different people. Um, and it's really important to be able to do that as well. Uh, ben, I know you had some sort of general information that you wanted to share with the people who are tuning in today as well. So perhaps if I leave it open to you for a few minutes as well on that front. Sure, and look, I, I, won't, I won't take long, Emma. I, I guess I just wanted to say, first and foremost, um, thank you to the, uh, the community sector as a whole for the enormous uh, work and effort that's going into uh, to your work at the moment. Uh, it, it has been an incredibly difficult few months. Uh, it's been an incredibly difficult few weeks for Victoria. Uh, and, you know, the thing that is really holding, holding us together through that period is the collaboration and engagement uh, across government, across government and other sectors, across government and the broader community, um, within the community sector. And it's really just been so impressive to see how people have adjusted to different working arrangements, have adjusted their own, uh, their own working arrangements, their own working models, their own business models, and, and responded to the needs of the community because that's really what's motivating all of us. Um, I do want to particularly shout out to the, um, to the DHHS team who've I mean, we heard from Natalia and Tammy um, before, but the, the, re the response within government has really been quite um, astounding. Uh, I guess, you know, in years gone by, there's kind of this um, debate about, um, you know, the quality and character of the public service and those kinds of things. And I mean, anyone who has seen the inside of the response to this emergency would just be uh, astonished by the professionalism, the dedication, the care that's happening in the public health team, uh, but much more broadly across the whole organisation. I know many people in, in this virtual room know Noah Geary uh, very well, and he's been called away this week, really focusing purely on the community engagement challenge. Uh, there are many people who've been um, engaged in different ways across that, across that, um, that response. I know some of you um, will be concerned and um, anxious about, we all are, right, about the, uh, the developments in the last week, the degree of community transmission in the community at the moment. Um, and uh, from a very practical service delivery um, perspective, 
we're not seeing change in, in service delivery arrangements right now. If staff live in restricted areas, they're able to, to attend work outside of those areas if they can't work from home. Uh, and, uh, you know, community services staff are able to move into these areas to deliver services if it's necessary to do that in a face-to-face -face way. So, um, you know, there isn't that immediate change in service delivery arrangements in the restricted suburbs, but obviously having said that, it's incredibly important that we all use common sense. We remain vigilant. You know, the recent guidance for um, COVID planning in the sector uh, that I presume is available on the website, Emma, uh, is incredibly important for organisations to understand and, and engage with for the benefit of staff, clients, community members. I think it is worth saying this part of the response is quite different in character from, you know, perhaps a March, April um, version of it. Uh, we are seeing um, more community transmission. We're seeing community transmission in communities that are vulnerable, that are perhaps a bit more marginal economically, that are a bit more marginal in terms of language and access to information. So therefore, I think probably we're going to see um, you know, more engagement by VCOS members with uh, the reality of COVID in their organisations and their client groups. Some of that we're already starting to see. So um, that guidance, I think, is incredibly important. But look, before, I think John is going to talk a bit more about some of these matters, but um, which will be excellent because he knows he, he, in one sentence he can describe more than my entire knowledge on these topics. Um, but the... Um, the, uh, the important thing, I think, and the thing that I know, Emma, you and VCOS are working for is to make sure that we keep that connection going, that we keep the partnership going, that we keep communications going, that we work together to, to, get, through this, um, to get through this crisis. Yeah, very much so. Thank you, Ben. And if I can just reiterate your thanks as well to the DHHS team, it's very much one of the things that's become really prominent during this crisis has been how much of a partnership uh, it's been and I think also the ability to for us to be able to raise um, any issues that arise really quickly with the team and then work towards what a solution might be uh, we've just really appreciated the responsiveness and, and I think the degree of partnership that's taken place and without question the level of uh, the, of care and I guess that one source of truth um, that's provided, as you say, through the Chief Health Office and, um, and the, the public health team and the, the ability to make decisions from there. And we acknowledge, I know that it's, um, I don't think it's overused in the sense of what we're seeing at the moment, that this is an unprecedented time. We are all navigating through as best we can and trying to identify how do we do that best and most collectively. And being able to have these webinars each month and each time we have them, I'm... Um, continually astounded at how much has changed in the last month. It feels like it was each time it was a year ago. So a really significant um, thank you to you and to your team as well. Very much appreciated, Ben, and thanks for being here today as well. Um, very much appreciated. Uh, it's now my pleasure, and Ben, you, you referred before to John Catford, um, who's also with us uh, today. John is playing a really key role in helping organisations returning uh, to face-to-face -face service delivery to assess risks and to make sure that organisations are COVID safe. John, I know you have a wealth of knowledge uh, in this space. And I guess at the moment, I've sort of got one key question for me that keeps coming in from our member organisations as well. And that is organisations have started preparing for a return to a sort of staggered return to work now for the last little while. And uh, particularly over the next few months, should organisations be preparing for a longer work from home period when they can? Well, hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, I think Tammy, Natalie and Ben have uh, already actually stolen a lot of my thunder because uh, I think their overview was absolutely on, on the mark. And there's rather little I can, can add, I think. But let, let, let's pick up this issue about um, forward planning. I mean, m my advice view is that, yes, you should start forward planning. I mean, things are likely to get better, and I'm afraid uh, on occasions they may get worse. But I think, you know, we need to be looking optimistically forward 
and planning how we get out of this terrible crisis. I mean, it will happen sooner or later, and we might as well start now. Uh, I think the advice that Ben referred to, which was issued on the 2nd of June for community services in terms of the, the planning framework or architecture is very sound. And I know a number of organizations are already using it. And I think that's, that's a, a starting point place. I think Appendix 4 in that document is also very good about listing a whole range of tips and issues and things to think about um, as you begin your, your planning exercise. So Emma, very briefly, I think, yes, I think it's good to start planning. And of course, most people are not living in these action areas at the moment. And the current restrictions are continuing and of course we were hoping that they would be eased a bit further. Um, I, I'm sure that will happen at some point, in which case it's much better to be ready to actually seize the moment. And what's so uh, interesting about this whole pandemic is how quickly things change one way or the other. I mean we were moving very fast to easing a few weeks ago. Okay we've had to pull back now but you know that it'll accelerate again. So I think um, um, it's a good idea to, to start thinking, look before you leap sort of scenarios. Thanks, John. And did you want to talk a little bit about, I know you've been doing a powerhouse of work within the department for, around resources to help organisations return to work and the sorts of things organisations uh, should consider. Now, I know some of that information is up online on the DHHS website, but could you talk a bit about the particular role that you're playing um, and the assistance that you're giving to the department and to organisations when they're looking at their return to work policies and anything else that you think is relevant as well? Well, I, I think probably the best role I can be is a bit of a devil's advocate and take a helicopter view and, and look at plans and proposals and just sort of think through it. And, you know, is there something missing? Or, you know, is there a blind spot? I mean, that's not a way of criticism. And in fact, when I do that, I find very few, but I think it's good good for someone sort of, quotes, objective, independent to, ha to have a look at these things. I mean, I think the guidance that I referred to and Ben referred to, you know, takes you step by step through this. Um, I mean, clearly it's very important to do a transmission risk assessment. I know this sounds a bit technical, but it's interesting. Those organizations that have done it, have found it very useful and it def definitely demonstrates where potential opportunities are to think a bit more creatively and differently. Um, I mean, for instance, I'm just working on some documents from the courts at the moment about restarting juries. and. The, the, there's some very creative thinking going on there about, about how to manage that. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that will fire up fairly soon, obviously not in, in the, uh, the action areas. Um, so I, I, I'm more than happy to have a look at plans and proposals um, if people are interested and would find that helpful. Um, but I, I think we need to probably just think about how we're going to manage service delivery in these action areas and particularly staff who may live in those action areas that are coming to work in our in our services. Um, some of the others have already touched on this but I think obviously we need to think about a good risk mitigation process without discriminating or victimizing people because they just happen to live in a, in a particular postcode. And I think we need to be careful that we are all in this together. Okay, some are, have got a heavy burden at the moment, but you know, we're, there's not the good guys and the bad guys. And I think certainly in the, in the work setting, we need to be very accommodating and understanding of people who we may work with who, who actually reside in those areas. Thanks, John. And just going back to your earlier comment as well, so are you happy for organisations to come to you directly with their sort of return to work plans or how would you like organisations to navigate that, knowing that, you know, this is, you know, I know the department is thrilled to have you there um, and the particular um, expertise that you bring as well. So what would be the best way for people to navigate that? Well, I think, that the best thing is to work through your liaison person, contact person within the department. And, um, you know, you could ask uh, if uh, 
you know, I might have a look at it. And, and then, I mean, there has to be some sort of prioritizing and queuing in all this. Um, I'm, I'm pretty flat out, but, you know, certainly I'd be more than happy and particularly over tricky issues. It, I think a lot of it is quite common sense a call. Um, and, I, you know, and I think, frankly, there is huge talent and understanding and wisdom in the sector, but it, it's, it's possibly areas where it, there's a tricky balancing act to make between a benefit to the to a client and a potential increased risk to staff or even volunteers and that that's often hard and and what i find it's quite useful just to talk it through with people and usually they will come up with the with the solution rather than rather than me so i don't know if that's helpful emma but i i think just work through your normal uh management communication systems and some of that may well end up on my desk Thank you very much, John, and thank you for joining us today as well. I know um, particularly as we've, we've spoken about throughout the forum today, looking at the fact that the situation is changing very quickly, inevitably it will continue to do so for at least a little while. Uh, and I think the expertise that you bring and the assistance you've given is very much appreciated. So thank you very much for being with us today as well. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to welcome um, just waiting for her to pop up on my screen. After the last seminar, we received lots of questions uh, around housing and homelessness services and responses for people who are sleeping rough in Victoria. So to answer these questions, we're now joined by Sherry Brunhout. Welcome, Sherry. It's lovely to see you. Um, Sherry is the Director of Housing Pathways in the Department of Health and Human Services. She's also worked in the community services sector as well, so understands things really well, both from the community sector point of view as well as from the DHHS point of view. Sherry, did you have sort of any introductory comments that you wanted to make before we get into comments as well? Yeah, sure. I thought um, it might be worth just bringing everybody up to speed with um, some of the work that has been happening through the homelessness service system um, in response to COVID. So if that's okay with you, Emma, I'll, um, and I do know you had my boss on earlier who, um, <laughs> who uh, acknowledged country. So thank you for that. Um, so back in um, very early in March, the homelessness service system became aware that um, to, in order to keep people safe from COVID-19, um, we were going to have to really ramp up our ability to offer accommodation to people so that they can follow the stay at home directives of, of public health. Um, so about mid-March, there was a $6 million um, allocation to the Housing Establishment Fund. We know it as HEF. Um, and HEF is an existing program that's used to purchase accommodation for people experiencing homelessness. So essentially the HEF um, allocation was doubled in March for, for the rest of the financial year to help people to um, help agencies to uh, purchase hotel accommodation so that people could, um, could shelter at home. Um, and obey those orders. Um, what we found was very quickly the, the need for that service was demonstrated. Um, there was a further $1.7 million announcement in May and a $9.8 million announcement in June. So as a result, there have been quite many thousands of people who have benefited from the homelessness service system and the ability to be able to um, uh, to uh, respond to their situation of homelessness by being able to purchase hotel accommodation. Um, I'd like to give a really big shout out to um, the Homelessness Peak Body Council of Homeless Persons, who's been really instrumental in helping the sector to respond in that way. Um, VCOS, obviously, Emma, you and your team have been amazing. The, the, the um, services who have really pivoted in a very different Such direction to support that has been um, terrific as well. So I really just want to give a shout out there. Um, some of the other things that have been happening in the homelessness portfolio, if that's okay, Emma, I'll just give a couple more updates. Um, the COVID isolation and recovery facilities. So we do understand that um, people experiencing homelessness may be at, um, or at risk of homelessness, might be at um, increased risk of exposure to COVID-19 because of um, living situations like overcrowding, like rough sleeping. Um, so government announced $8.8 .8 million to establish four uh, COVID isolation recovery facilities, which are um, in partnership with St Vincent's Hospital and Homelessness Services 
uh, dedicated facilities for people um, who have tested positive to COVID or um, are awaiting testing for COVID to be able to receive the health care that they require within a homelessness setting as well. Um, now I can report back to the group that um, what, a, what a, a great reflection on the homelessness service system that um, the 75 bed capacity that we do have in the SERFs, the COVID isolation recovery facilities, has not been required, um, which is great to uh, plan for the worst, but great that we haven't been able to, um, haven't needed to, to use all of those beds. So. Um, those agencies with um, St Vincent's have been really terrific in being able to repurpose those facilities to be able to give a health and homelessness response to people who require it. So that's been a really great example of, of seeing where we're, we're very COVID ready, um, but able to really pivot very quickly to, um, to provide for people's needs as well. Um, and I would also just like to give you an update on in um, some of the service coordination work that's happened in the homelessness service system as well. Um, so in response to um, many people staying in hotels, obviously we need to do things a little differently in the homelessness service system. So we've established a, a HART, which is the um, Homelessness Emergency Accommodation Response Team. So huge shout out there to the homelessness networkers and the LASNs, the local area service networks, who have just really done a lot of heavy lifting in coming together to be able to plan and coordinate uh, responses to people in emergency accommodation and, and really lean in and, and uh, work together to meet their needs. So those um, hearts have been running for um, about a month or so now. They meet very frequently. Um, they're very um, client focused and being able to provide those wraparound supports to people staying in hotels uh, to make sure that they're, they're safe and that their needs are being met. Um, so where to from here? Would we like to keep uh, people in hotels so that they can lay down roots and grow old there? No, um, it's certainly not a, um, a permanent housing response. Um, so we're working with the sector on um, a fairly large data uh, project where we're seeking information on uh, the clients who are staying in hotels uh, because we know that there's no one size fits all response to homelessness. So being able to really understand who is um, currently utilising that emergency accommodation response will help us to plan the exit strategy um, so that we can make sure that people are cared for um, and exit into an appropriate housing and or support um, uh, response uh, when it's safe for them to, to leave the hotels. So there's a lot of work underway at the moment. I guess, Emma, some of the things that we're hearing from the sector, um, the sector um, are raising with us um, uh, concerns about job seeker and job keeper and, and uh, the fact that that's helped people to afford housing and what, what, what will happen at the end of that. And I think um, Ben and, and you, Emma, have uh, spoken about that earlier today. Um, we're, we're hearing from our service system as well that demand is really fluctuating and it's very difficult for agencies to predict what the demand might look like. So for example, in some local areas, we're having a spike on homelessness service system um, in one week and then very quiet the following week. So really difficult for agencies to be able to predict where the demand is going. Just on that, Sherry, as well, mm. have you seen an increase, and I know um, our members have um, sort of first-hand experience with this as well, but just curious from the departmental point of view, mm. the number of people, is has there been an increase in the number of people who are experiencing homelessness for the first time? Yeah, so Emma, um, homelessness service system, as you know, um, but for other people who may not know, um, we have a, a national data system um, and that data comes to us about, um, about four, between four to six weeks after the end of the month. So it, it's difficult for us to see that tracking um, in real time, but certainly we've got these great relationships with our service system and they're absolutely telling us that they're seeing a um, uh, new clients coming into the homelessness service system who haven't been accessing homelessness services before. Um, 
who are experiencing uh, financial difficulties in lieu of the, you know, the, the issues that we've got with um, employment um, throughout the state. Uh, the homelessness service system is quite amazing at being able to uh, pull a rabbit out of the hat, but um, be able to support people who are at risk of homelessness. Our data shows us in non-COVID times at any rate, um, that most people that come to a homelessness service system who are at risk of homelessness don't then become homeless. Um, so the service system is, is very good and has some great programs to support people who are at risk of homelessness. So we're keeping a very close eye on that for example, one of those programs is the private rental assistance program. So we have given additional resources to homelessness services so that they can make those responses. So we're keeping a very close eye on what that might look like and particularly interested in working with our data analytics um, colleagues here at DHHS to be thinking about what um, the trajectory or predictions might be in terms of the call on the homelessness service system to um, prevent homelessness for people into the future. And that's it's going to be really important isn't it? I know we're seeing sort of anecdotally from members they're telling us look they're seeing about a 25 to 30 percent increase of new people coming through their doors who probably never thought they would need assistance in terms of things like emergency relief and homelessness etc and keeping in mind at the moment, we've got that increase in the job seeker payment um, and the job keeper payments as well. So it's, you know, I guess it's, as you say, looking at the data that's coming through now as it does, and then what, what will continue from that point as well. Really interesting, because you mentioned earlier about, you know, the hotels and the, um, the outreach programs, which I think have been successful. And I think one of the interesting things out of COVID is we're seeing some programs running that we were probably always told were never really possible. Uh, and just wouldn't mind going a little bit deeper in terms of whatever you're able to say at the moment, knowing that you might not be at liberty to comment on this at, at, in sort of great depth, but really interested in how successful you think those programs have been. And I know you mentioned earlier about the data you're collecting from organisations around what, so I guess there's a question here about what happens at the end, because we, we all know we can't just turn the tap off and have everyone who's currently being, you know, housed in a hotel, et cetera, suddenly exiting into homelessness. So if you wouldn't mind talking about that into sort of more detail, if to start with how successful you think the program has been, but perhaps what you envisage um, in terms of next steps, if you're at liberty to be able to talk about that. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Emma, asking all the easy questions today. Good on you. Um, no, no, look, um, the the hotels, the, the primary um, aim of the hotels were to keep um, individuals safe through COVID um, and to keep the community safe. And have they been successful? Absolutely. We are not seeing um, the numbers of COVID infections through the homeless, homeless people population that um, might have been um, predicted at one point early on. So incredibly successful at being able to keep um, individuals and the community safe. Um, what a great opportunity. So we now have so many rough sleepers who have um, intermittent uh, contact with the homelessness service system or indeed very little um, contact with our wider community service system in the past have now um, moved into hotels, are accepting support, are engaging with our support workers. Um, and the support workers are very, very, um, are skilled at being able to build that trusting relationship. So the opportunity now to um, uh, to build on that and to be able to really wrap services around people who um, who could really benefit from uh, from that work. Um, so we are very keen to be working with the sector on an exit strategy for hotels. Certainly, um, you know, the, the, there's been um, uh, uh, the our housing minister has met with the homelessness service system on a couple of occasions um, and has been very encouraged by the opportunity that's before us. Um, 
I guess what's really important, and I would, um, I guess I'm speaking directly to any homelessness service system uh, staff who are on this call. Um, by this Friday, we're wanting um, the data to come back um, on people staying in hotels. That data will be incredibly useful to us to be able to plan an exit strategy from hotels. Um, the homelessness service system is very aware that um, if you get the right response, the right support and the right housing type to the right person at the right time, you can absolutely change their life. The homelessness service system also knows that if we give an undercooked response or the wrong response or an ill targeted response to people, it doesn't get the outcome that we're looking for. So for us to plan a really successful exit strategy, we're really gonna to need to know what, um, what the characteristics are and what the needs are of people staying in hotels so that we can plan that appropriately. And I would say that there are people staying in hotels across the state. Um, they are singles, they are families, they are young, they're older. Um, you know, there's a whole range of people there and we'd really like to, um, we'd really like the sector's help to plan a, um, an exit strategy that makes sense for the, pe for the people who need it. Thanks, Sherry. And I'll, I'll put this as a bit of a shout out as well, but I know one of the priorities we're pushing really hard for at the moment uh, is around looking at, you know, some of the priorities coming out of the pandemic, noting, of course, that this is in many ways what's been described as a pink recession in terms of looking at the particular impact on women and on young people. But we also see this phenomenal opportunity in terms of social housing. Uh, we know, and I'm, I'm not sure if you're able to comment on it freely or not, Sherry, but, you know, we just know that this is a really amazing opportunity for us to create jobs at the same time as building homes for people. So it's a bit of a no brainer. When we look at what um, has been able to be achieved out of the hotels program and all of the other work that you talked about, knowing that, that first and foremost, we need people to be able to have a house somewhere safe to live. It's impossible during a time of a pandemic, let alone regularly to say, well, how do you stay home and stay, stay safe if you don't have a home in the very first place? So, um, and I think the work that you've undertaken around hotels, et cetera, has really shown what, what is possible. And I think it's interesting out of a pandemic where a number of things that were deemed impossible prior, we're now seeing happen. So we wanna make the most of that opportunity. Just one last question for you as well is in terms of um, a number of our members are saying people are challenged, having sort of some challenges in terms of being able to socially distance, particularly if they're in overcrowded accommodation. So places like rooming houses, et cetera, as well. Interested to know, um, what you might have been working on in that front or alternatively what you think some of the solutions might be looking forward as well. Yeah, sure. So look, absolutely, it, it, it is difficult to socially isolate when you're living in, um, when the amenity of, of where you're living doesn't allow for that to happen easily. Um, what I would say is that there's been an absolute truckload of work that's been done by uh, Chia Vic, so the um, peak agency for community housing, and big shout out to the work that they've been doing. Um, they've issued some guidance on best practice for rooming houses um, and being able to um, support rooming house providers um, uh, with really practical um, common sense strategies that they can employ to keep residents safe. Um, also that said, um, there's been a number of, uh, you know, the way that we've changed service delivery in homelessness services that um, that were perhaps using uh, shared facilities so that we've had to make some pretty um, big changes to the way that we, we're delivering those services. Um, that said, um, there have been a small number of um, uh, people who have lived in um, congregate facilities who have uh, tested positive to COVID. Um, the way that they have been managed and and the way that those um, people have been supported without any subsequent transmission through those facilities has really proven how well the sector has responded to, um, to that to that need um, and how well and, and how sensibly they're managing um, keeping everyone safe who are in their care. So um, I really wanted to acknowledge the work that they're doing because um, yes, it is a big risk when people are living in congregate facilities, um, but the writing's on the wall that the sector have just been absolutely amazing in the way that they've dealt with that and really contain that risk. Thanks, Sherry. And uh, if I can also acknowledge the phenomenal work that you and your team have done um, in terms of working on the housing front, I know the way that you have worked in partnership with the sector 
is very much appreciated by all, certainly is by myself and the team at BCOS and all of the organisations that you've given a shout out to um, along the way. And I think your personal knowledge of having worked in the sector as well as from government, as well as in government at the moment, it really does enable you to have that, you know, the, the perspective that perhaps not everyone um, is able to bring. So I just really want to acknowledge that too and to a very sincere thank you. And thank you for being here with us today as well. I know, as I said, out of the last forum, we had lots of questions around housing and homelessness. Uh, and it's fantastic that you were able to be with us today. So a huge thank you, Sherry, and have a lovely rest of your afternoon. Good thank on you, Emma, thank you. Thanks so much. And it's now my absolute pleasure um, for the final update from the day is from the newish, I think, CEO of Family Safety Victoria, hopefully Aleri Butler from Family Safety Victoria. Aleri, hopefully in some ways as a, as a newer CEO, you, you've got to take that, I think, for as long as you can in terms of how, how long you can use that for. Um, it is really lovely to have you with us for the first time. And again, we, out of the last uh, webinar that we held, we had lots of questions coming out in relation to um, family violence and looking at trends, I think, in disasters that have happened um, overseas and in Victoria traditionally and how that might have played out or might be playing out for us um, at the moment as well. We know that an emergency like COVID-19 can mean very particular risks um, for women and, and children in particular um, who are being isolated often with quite violent perpetrators. So perhaps again, before I get into um, questions, O'Leary, again, if I perhaps can throw to you for any sort of overall over comments that, that you would like to make. And I know you bring a very rich background in terms of the work you've done previously, which inevitably will be helping the whole state of Victoria uh, at the moment. So I'll just um, open up with, with any sort of general comments you wanna make before we get into questions. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Thanks very much for the invitation and the, and the lovely welcome. And yeah, I am going to use new for as long as I can. <laughs> I've been here for about three months in post um, when I joined just before, well, just as we shut down, went into lockdown and started working from home. So it would be lovely to hopefully sometime in the future meet people properly face to face um, um, in the real world. Um, but thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I too would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to all the Aboriginal elders of communities that may be listening in um, and also to acknowledge the victim survivors who may be listening in today and we keep very much at the forefront of our minds all those who are experiencing family violence and sexual assault today and every day um, including remembering those who've lost their lives tragically as a result of family violence for whom we undertake this work. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to start by giving a brief introduction. I'm assuming most people listening in know about Family Safety Victoria being an administrative office of government. Um, it was our third birthday yesterday, in fact, um, 1st of July. Um, so we've been leading the delivery of key um, recommendations from the Royal Commission into Family Violence, um, which includes ensuring that people with lived experience are central to um, and guide the reform. Um, and we collaborate really closely with the sector and with peak bodies across the state as, and your, your own organisation, as you know, to deliver um, an improved coordinated community response to family violence and sexual assault, which involves a whole system approach. Um, and our aim is to very much make sure that survivors, victim survivors access support earlier and making sure that perpetrators are also held accountable and change their behaviour. So working towards that prevention. Um, I wanted to just give a quick overview uh, as an introduction really to um, give a bit of an outline as to what we know from services in Victoria um, and what, a bit about what we've been doing in response before going into some of the questions. Um, and as, as previous speakers have said, these are really unprecedented times. Um, and I think it's worth acknowledging that we're already responding to a global pandemic of violence against women and girls. It was classified a global pan pandemic in 2013 by the, in the, by the World Health Organization. Um, and that's now combined with the more recent global pandemic of, of COVID-19. And that really creates devastating intersecting impacts and consequences for women and children in particular. Um, and we also know tragically, um, along with the COVID related deaths that we've seen, um, not only in Australia, but globally, we're also seeing a rise in many countries of fatal male violence against women. Um, since January in Australia, uh, 27 women have been killed. Um, which we know thanks to the, the harrowing work undertaken by um, the County Dead Women researchers. 
Um, and that includes in Victoria, five women who've lost their lives in Victoria as a result of family violence. Um, and three of those were women killed in May alone. So, you know, it's a really big, it's a really big concern and, and countless thousands more women, children and men live daily with the experience of um, violence and abuse or the legacies of violence and abuse, whilst many of the perpetrators of this abuse remain um, unchallenged, unaccountable or invisible in many cases. And we're dealing already with escalating levels of family violence in the state. Um, recent crime statistics show that the number of incidents recorded by Victoria Police, for example, that was the highest on record in the 12 months to 31st of March 2020. Um, and police incident L17 data also indicate a steady increase in reported incidents in the last eight weeks. Um, so that's, that criminal justice data is, is showing an increase. Um, we're also hearing from universal services, from health and other services, that they're identifying far more family violence um, at the moment. They're recording increased severity of violence. Um, they're having more disclosures compared to pre-COVID times. Um, Safe Steps, the statewide helpline and, and specialist um, provider of support, they they're telling us that they're doing um, more comprehensive risk assessments with people who face elevated risks from perpetrators and who require immediate protection. Um, Safe Steps and other organisations are also telling us they're getting higher calls from third parties, so from family or friends or neighbours and so on. And that they're also getting more calls around elder abuse, um, where, for example, adult male children are being violent in the home with their parents. Um, we're also seeing an increase in concern about young people using violence, whether that's physical or sexual abuse um, in the home or amongst family members, particularly during the lockdown period. Um, and in relation to perpetrator services and perpetrator interventions, the men's referral service experienced an initial increase in calls, um, particularly from men um, who were concerned about their behaviour for the first time. So we're reaching out for, for help to change their behaviour. Um, and we're also hearing, as I know my other colleagues are across government, um, from Aboriginal services that demand has increased, um, both for immediate crisis support and also for ongoing community support. Um, and we're working with the Delta Jar Partnership Forum um, to support family violence ACO services in their business continuity. And we're also focusing on um, in improving their industry plans at the moment to integrate those into the wider work we're doing around workforce and industry development. Um, and even though we are working remotely and adhering to the social and physical distancing, the Orange Door sites continue to operate um, with no disruption to service, which is which is a fantastic achievement. Um, and in the last week of June, there were um, 1,098 referrals for support, and those referrals week on week are steadily increasing. Um, and as some of your um, colleagues and some, some of those listening in will know, the um, immediate response from the Victorian government has been, has been quite significant. We provided uh, $40.2 million in funding to ensure those at risk um, or who are experiencing family violence and sexual assault in the community have access to support they need. Um, that funding includes $20 million targeted at the provision of short-term accommodation with accompanying support. Um, for victim survivors who need a place of safety or who, who don't feel safe to isolate at home. Um, and this also includes funding for accommodation where it's needed for perpetrators so victim survivors can stay safe in their own homes if that's what's needed. And the funding also includes um, $20.2 million to, um, to help family violence and sexual assault services meet the increase in demand at this time. Um, and, and we're expecting continued increase for demand during the, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and just a couple of other things we're working on uh, very quickly. We're also working with peak bodies and I want to give a shout out to all our peak bodies who are working with us so collaboratively um, under really challenging times. Um, we're working with them to support the sector with regular briefings, live stream briefings and forums and, and workshops and so on. We've developed sector guidance to support agencies um, and adapted a multi-agency risk management practice notes to outline the heightened risk um, and the additional risks and, and needs of survivors at this time, um, and also to raise awareness of additional considerations for managing the risk posed by perpetrators. Um, and that's, that guidance um, is accompanied by some uh, videos, online videos um, that are available um, on our website. Um, so um, that, that's received really positive feedback from the sector, which has been great. Um, and we've also published information online for funded agencies to support business continuity. 
um, and service delivery. Um, and we're partnering with services to develop practical information and resources to be shared um, at, in effect, what is the, the new front line, pharmacies, supermarkets, mm -hmm. um, doctor surgeries, um, places where families are able to go at the moment um, to make sure that there's information available to signpost people to support. Um, so those are just some I of the that's things. That's a really interesting example, I think, of actually something perhaps new that's come out of the pandemic as well. So yeah. interested in perhaps talking about that a little further and it's probably, I'm, I'm interested in, and I think you've covered a lot of the um, issues as well about, but just to dig a little deeper in terms of, I guess, what some of the particular, I guess, the weaknesses that have come out of the pandemic and I think some of the things that are challenges have come to mind are things like you know, when we had homeschooling, et cetera, happen and people being, you know, uh, when they're locking down in their homes, literally, you know, the the fact that it's it's harder to to um, to get away from a perpetrator, harder to seek assistance. But then looking at some of the initiatives that are in place, such as um, having support in supermarkets and pharmacies and other things. Interested at in, um, considering any further around maybe some sort of the strength in family in the family violence system that that can really help people who might be experiencing difficulty at the moment as well. Yeah, well, I think in my experience, and I've I've worked in for thirty years or so with with services in in particular in the UK and Europe around around family violence and sexual assault. Um, it, no other sector that I've worked with knows better that we need to continually evolve and meet community needs during a pandemic because they're already dealing with that global pandemic of, of violence and abuse. Um, so you know they've responded really really well and, and, and very flexibly. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to flag is that. Um, the feedback that we've been getting is also endorsed by some of the research that's come out from Monash University. Um, and, and we've surveyed, um, they've surveyed the frontline family violence practitioners um, through April and May this year and found particularly that the pandemic has led to an increase in not only frequency and severity of violence against women, um, but 59% of respondents reported um, an increase in frequency, 50% reported an increase in severity, but particularly they reported an increase in the complexity of needs. That was reported by 86% of, of frontline practitioners um, and 42% of respondents reported an increase in first time reporting by women. So I think that's just as you said, you know, that's really, really significant. We, don't, we also know that survivors are saying to us that for many who've experienced coercive controlling behavior, their lives in lockdown aren't much different to the deprivation of liberty they were experiencing as part of the coercive control um, by perpetrators beforehand. Um, and, and that's, that's I think is really our, our challenge because what COVID has undoubtedly exacerbated abuse and control by perpetrators. Um, it's increased monitoring and threats to expose women and children to the virus or with withhold access to healthcare. So we have to be really innovative and, and adjust our services to make sure that you know, survivors and, and families can access the help and support they need. Um, in relation to the the strengths and weaknesses. Um, I mean, we're, I think we're pretty familiar generally with the strengths and weaknesses in the system from the Royal Commission evidence from recent Vega reports and the independent monitor reports. Um, so, I mean, some of my observations have been um, services have done really well, I think, to, to highlight how flexible they can be. Um, many services weren't fully accessible to the, those unable to walk through the front door. So, so many services have had to shift very quickly to deliver web chat and online responses, which has been great and the uptake on those has been really significant. Um, it's also highlighted for me that how much of our narrative across systems has been on somebody leaving the abuser. Um, when in reality, we know that's really dangerous to do. Um, and we also know that um, many, for many survivors, they don't actually want to leave or um, don't want to leave their family members or leave the abuser. So I think we need, we've needed to focus much more on um, not only providing refuge and crisis accommodation, but doing safety planning and support for women in, you know, within the family, in the relationship and in their own homes. And I think that's something we need to do more of, as well as making sure that um, perpetrators are more visible and that we have a greater focus on removing perpetrators are necessary to stop their abuse. Um, and I want to particularly acknowledge um, the fantastic work going on in, in ACCO family violence services in our communities, delivering a whole family approach, and, and you know, which can teach us a lot in relation to delivering holistic support services in our communities. Um, the other thing I've, I've noticed um, as, as an issue, I think, which I think we need to address is it's very easy for sexual violence and abuse um, and their services that, that respond to sexual violence and abuse to fall off the radar at this time. The narrative nationally and globally is around family violence, domestic violence, because we're focused very much on lockdown in our own homes. 
um, right, rightly so. Um, but I think we also need to think about what the current climate means for people being sexually abused, sexually exploited. For example, if they're homeless, as we just talked about, or if landlords, um, you know, maybe demanding sex for rent, for example, or somebody's being sexually abused by community members or through the sex industry, as well as in families, because survivors don't experience those forms of abuse in silos. And I think we really need to make sure we've got a holistic response to those to those issues. And the complexity, I think, of family violence has really shone a light on the critical role of our community networks, our community services, um, and the vital role in particular of schools, health services, pharmacies, as I've said, employers as well, and doctors in providing access to help and support. Um, and the final thing that I just wanted to, to flag um, is, is it's also, I think, exposed some data gaps in our system. Yeah. The fact that we don't know how COVID is specifically impacting on migrant or multicultural or diverse communities, I think, highlights our data and recording systems need improvement across, across services and across systems. Um, you know, we should be recording sexuality, ethnicity, disability, sex, gender, identity, etc. Um, across the board. And I think we just need to have much, much richer and more meaningful data across our service systems. So that's one of the observations I've had. Thanks, Aliri. And I think that's a really, um, it's such an important observation, isn't it, in terms of uh, issues that already existed uh, and then seeing, I, I think, a real highlight, you know, highlight's probably the wrong word, but a real focus on how does, as you say, we already had a pandemic in terms of issues around um, family violence. How does it play out during a health pandemic? What are some of the issues that are emphasised? But also at the same time, what, the, the what lessons do we need to learn, which I think we already knew to be candid around knowing that we need more, more data, but also what are some of the other things that we can do that actually might make it easier for people to report or to seek assistance, et cetera, that we see during a pandemic. And we know as well when there's other crises overseas that um, I think some of the trend of what we were, we've seen here was replicated around the initial perhaps underreporting because women and children were not able to get out and report. And then what we're seeing now around the additional reporting which you've spoken about, but what's to come. Uh, and I think there's real lessons to learn from what we've seen in times of crises before, but uh, I suspect, unfortunately, that there's probably considerably more reporting to come as restrictions, et cetera, are loosened and, and society, you know, might shift into the next stage as well. So interest in sort of any kind of key observations you have on that front as well in closing. Um, I think I, th that's a really good point, and I think we're really expecting um, unprecedented demand as we ease out of lockdown. Um, I don't know that's happening in different areas at the moment. Um, I think I think there are some changes that we've seen that we should really continue. We can't go back to how it how it was. Um, the systems weren't working, which is part of the reform work that we're doing anyway. Um, and I think it's really been incredible to see how the sectors have mobilised and changed and adapted, so that everybody who needs the support and help gets it. Um, I think that's really been very, very powerful um, as an observation. I think the use of digital forums and engagement is something we should consider doing, not only for, for our work and for meetings, but actually to make sure services are more accessible, but also thinking about digital exclusion and how services, um, survivors and families in different communities actually don't have access to, to digital te technology. So that's, um, that's an additional barrier. So that's something we need to focus on and, and overcome. Um, I'd like us to be able to maintain also um, how we've quickly responded um, to, to changing needs and in our communities as rapidly as we have done. Um, and, and you know, I've, I've been amazed at how quickly some of the bureaucracies just fallen away, which has been which has been great. Um, alongside, we ensure we focus on um, how community services can be more sustainable in the future. Um, I, we are we are evaluating some of these new ways of working. We're working with DHHS colleagues at the moment, so we're looking, for example, at a, doing a rapid review of how the adjustments in perpetrator interventions are working well at the moment, and, and what needs to be continued there, um, and also how the online services and web chat functions can can happen um, and, and be continued. But I think really for me, the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has only really highlighted significantly the importance of the reform work in strengthening our responses and in connecting services and, and maximising safe disclosure points in local communities. Um, 
I mean, some of the reform work that um, we've been progressing and prioritizing up to now are continuing, albeit in adjusted ways. So I can give you some examples. So um, work is continuing with Marum, for example, to develop new perpetrator tools um, and resources, both for workforces um, around the mental health service system, alcohol and drug services, homelessness services, and so on, but also for family violence specialist services and, and those who work with perpetrators at the moment. Um, we're also working with sector colleagues to strengthen community-based outreach support, our case management support system and therapeutic interventions. And the rollout of the Orange Door is continuing. Um, we're due to open um, the Orange Door in Central Highlands and Loddon later this year, so that's all on track. Um, so there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, um, as well as progressing the, the Vago recommendations we've recently had. And I also just wanted to give a shout out to my colleagues. I mean, they've been working incredibly hard on a range of the business as usual reforms underpinning all of this work. Um, but the industry workforce work is, is really critical. That's one of the challenges that the sector is saying to us that they need additional support on. Um, we re recently launched a family violence jobs hub um, um, in the last month, and there's been an awareness campaign around that. And more than 9,700 potential employers um, and job seekers have visited um, that jobs hub since it launched last month, which I think is, is phenomenal. Um, it's part of an attraction and recruitment campaign that we're undertaking. Um, and there's also um, the sub there's, um, online campaigns, I think it's called So What Do You Do, um, which is an online campaign which people should look at. There's been 70,000 reviews of the promotional campaign materials and animations um, to check that out. Um, and I think it's really important that people need to understand the, the range of roles and the types of roles in the family violence and sexual abuse community sector, um, that, you know, so that we can make sure that the industry workforce planning is, is, is as robust as robust as possible. Um, and I think returning to a, a norm that we previously had is, is, is no longer acceptable. You know, as I said, it's not an option. Um, and I think as well as learning from what we've been doing in the last few months um, to, to maximize our efforts to deliver the reform, I think it's really important to not forget that we know what needs to happen to prevent family violence and, and sexual assault. Um, we've known for several years that we can do something about it, not only about responding in a crisis, responding much earlier on, making sure there's early help and support available, but also focusing on primary prevention. Um, and that needs to also continue to be our priority because we know that family violence and rape and sexual assault, harassment, forced marriage, stalking, um, female genital mutilation, all forms of violence and abuse that we're needing to address in our families and in our communities, none of them are inevitable. They're all entirely preventable um, with the necessary political will and resources. And that's what we really need to prioritize on, you know, on in going forward to make sure that we, we prioritize prevention as well as the emergency response. Thank you. I think um, that's a, um, a really sound note to end on about that prioritising prevention as well as the response. And I think it's something that we've all been working um, very hard towards and need to just continue to do so. Larry, if I can just say a huge thank you for joining with us today and a huge also shout out to the organisations that you mentioned um, earlier as well. I know, for example, Safe, Safe Steps is doing a phenomenal job in terms of that 24-7 um, response, etc., as well. But it's fantastic having you in the role. Very much look forward to continuing to work with you. As you say, pandemic and beyond, and the world is not going to go back to what it what it was prior. And for us, it's about taking what are some of the positive things that have come out of a you know pretty horrendous situation to say, well, actually, what can we take that's actually going to change people's lives for the better in the long run. So thank you very much uh, for joining with us today. Very much appreciate it. I thank really you, Emma. Continuing to work with you as well. Thanks thank you. Me. Thank you. It's now my absolute pleasure in closing to thank all of the presenters who are with us today to share their expertise and their information. I would also like to say a huge shout out to the VCOS team uh, who not only make these webinars possible, but are working day and night to do everything possible uh, to work with our colleagues in the community sector, our colleagues in the department and in government. I would like to absolutely acknowledge the staff uh, throughout um, government and government departments and if you, in this instance as well, particularly to the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, it's been great to work in partnership, as I mentioned earlier, where we can acknowledge issues as they arise and look to see how do we uh, address those. And the partnership that's developed over that time is very much appreciated. Agiri Alexandratos wasn't able to join us today because of the critical work he's undertaking during um, the pandemic and the community response. So I would like to give an absolute shout out to Agiri 
and also to Amity Durham, who uh, does a huge amount of work uh, with us in particular as well. Um, as well as to our colleagues more broadly in government as well. I particularly like to give a big shout out to the community sector organisations who again work night and day with uh, wanting to make ensure that vulnerable Victorians are at the forefront of their thinking and at the forefront of every single thing that we all do. So my sincere thanks to everyone. Uh, I wish you a very happy afternoon and uh, look forward to joining with you at a future webinar uh, in another month's time. Thank you very much.